This is Ivan Kulov, the Russian bear. Yes, I've wrestled many times. I had the pleasure defeating Bruno San Martino, WWF champion. But I want to encourage everybody to listen to In Your Head, online.com, the best in the West and the East. All right, we are back, and we're joined by the living legend, Bruno San Martino. We want to welcome you to uh, In Your Head. Well, thank you very much, Jack. Nice to be here with you and all the folks uh, listening out there. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you here. Want to let everybody, oh, yeah. let everybody, yeah, let everybody know that you're actually going to be at in Charlotte, uh, August 14th through the 17th is is the event NWA Legends Fans Fest, mm-hmm. and uh, you can go right to the website, it's nwalegends.com, and we have the link right on our website. And um, you're you're going to be there. You're going to be doing some autographs and uh, meeting with the fans. And there's actually going to be a Q and A with you too on that Sunday. Yeah, I believe this is going to be on Saturday afternoon sometimes. I believe four. I could be mistaken. It will be a photo uh, session for about an hour or so. And then uh, I believe an hour and a half of question and answers Sunday morning. I'm not sure of the time. And then I think I have a three-hour autograph session. And uh, that's uh, what I'll be doing there for for those two days. Right, yeah. On the Saturday, it's uh, actually 5 p.m. It's going to be the photo op- opportunities. Right. And then uh, Sunday, like you said, it's at uh, 9.30 will be the Q&A. It's going to be with you and Ivan Koloff, so that will be really good. And then at noon, the autograph session starts. Right, yeah. Yeah, looking forward to it. Like I say, I've not been in Charlotte, and uh, it's, it's weird because throughout my 24-year career, I've been all over the world, really, and all over the United States, but... Uh, Charlotte, uh, no. So, <laughs> so it, it'll be uh, it'll be a nice thing for me, you know, to to go there and meet some of the folks there. Yeah, because it'll probably give an opportunity to all the wrestling fans in Charlotte who might not have uh, got to see you before. Yes, so it'll be great. Mm-hmm. Now, for the Q and A with you and Ivan Koloff, um, have you like kept in touch with Ivan over the years? No, uh, no. I've always had the great respect for him because in our heyday, in our heyday. Ivan was about a 300 pounder and I was 275 and um, I may be a little bragging here but I, I, he and I used to have phenomenal matches. I wrestled him uh, many times and uh, I used to love to wrestle him because for a big guy uh, weight wise he was, he was quick, he, 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 was, uh, he, he was very very good and, uh, and we gelled well because we had some truly great matches through the years so I always had great great respect for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've had him on uh, on the show here twice, and uh, in his book, you know, he talks a lot about the match w- when he won the title from you, and how like just the fans went quiet, and he talks a lot about his reaction. You know, uh, he was actually kind of scared and everything. But what was like your reaction? You know, when you lost the title after such a long title reign? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, it, it was really a, a, a shock. I, I couldn't believe what had happened. Ivan came off of that top rope with a knee. Uh, drop on the upper chest and neck and he really came down pretty hard and to be honest I thought that maybe uh, maybe something happened that I was maybe hurt some because uh, the garden was completely sold out Madison Square Garden and uh, I couldn't hear a peep I couldn't hear any kind of a sound and I thought oh my god I wonder what's wrong but then Arnold Scoland if you remember that name he he came over and he said, are you okay? And I heard him perfectly clear. And I said, uh, yeah, I think so. So he gets, he helps me up. And as I made my way out of the ring, I, I still couldn't hear a, a, a peep, nothing. And, and this has really touched me deeply because then as I was walking, there were some people literally, and not exaggerating, crying, saying, Bruno, we still love you, you're still the best, blah, blah, blah. I, I couldn't believe they were so deeply touched that I uh, lost the title, (laughs) and I absolutely did not expect that kind of a reaction. I don't think anybody did. They expected maybe Koloff being the villain to get a lot of booze and what have you, but there was just complete dead silence, and it it was just eerie. It was just I never experienced anything like that in my old 24-year career. Mm -hmm. Uh, We should get a couple of callers, so let's get to them quick. we got a Jai here on the line. Hi. Um, my question is, uh, what what do you think Vince McMahon would think of uh, what his son has done to the WWE? Well, look, 
I've said this before because some people agree or disagree with me. This is a free country, and people who like it, they, they enjoy it. They will free, feel, free, feel free to watch and enjoy it. Myself, I'm very appalled. I'm appalled to what he's done to professional wrestling. I've been uh, outspoken about it from uh, day one, probably. Uh, I didn't appreciate... Uh, the, the the nudity, the vulgarity, the profanity, a lot of the craziness that they do. I'm sorry, but for me, for Bruno San Martino, uh, I, I I was very um, I I refuse to watch it because I'm offended by it. I'm disgusted with it, and and I just uh, I would have never never dreamed that wrestling uh, the way I knew it that it would take such a, a different uh, uh, road, a different direction. So for myself. No, I, I have uh, I, I refuse to watch it because I absolutely uh, don't don't like it, don't agree with it, uh, and like I said, I, if I know if I had young kids, uh, I absolutely wouldn't allow them to watch it. Do you think that's why these uh, fan fests uh, like they do so well? Because a lot of wrestling fans, you know, they they want to remember the wrestling the way they they enjoyed it, the what they grew up with, and you know, it's a big reason why they like to come to these and uh, you know meet people like yourself. Well, you know, I, I, you know, I can, I, I don't know if that's a fact, but I can tell you this: that when I go to Boston or New York or uh, wherever, mm -hmm. uh, and fans come to me, I get two kinds. I get some of the uh, people, let's say in their forties or whatever, and they tell me, "Gee, I used to watch you when I was a kid. I used to come with my dad, saw you in the Boston Garden or Madison Square, well, wherever they saw me." But then I have some younger folks that come and they say, "Gee." Uh, I heard so much about you from my father or my grandfather or, or whatever. I saw some films, and I just wanted to have this opportunity to, to meet you in person from all that I've seen in a film. So, you know, th this is the kind of stuff I get. So, uh, I, you know, I, uh, that doesn't answer your question, I know, but, but that, that's what I get from the fans uh, everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have anything else, Jay? Well, no, because... I figured that out of everybody, you probably knew Vince the most. What was he like? Because uh, uh, nobody you mean really Vince has Senior? that. What was yeah. he like? Yeah. So, so what you're was he me? like his Was he like his son, or was he different? Were you talking about the father? Yeah, yeah. senior. Oh no, no. I uh, look, look at. Uh, I wrestled for the father a lot, and I'm not going to tell you that it was uh, smooth sailing all the time. We had our we had our differences in that, which is only normal, natural you know, amongst people. But uh, I cannot even begin to compare the two. I mean, if his father were living and saw what his son did, I can assure you that he would be absolutely appalled and angry and, and, and everything else. His father would never, in my opinion, he would never, never have approved of what his uh, son has done to professional wrestling. That, uh, I, that I, I feel very, very sure about. Thanks for calling in, Jai. Thank you, Jack. I'll uh, call him later. All right, thanks, man. Uh, let's see, got uh, kicks here on the line. First off, Bruno, it is an honor to talk to you. You're an absolute legend in this business. Um, oh, thank you very kindly. Um, well, I just wanted to ask, apparently, uh, right now I've been reading a lot of uh, articles that the WWE is planning to have a more family-friendly uh, uh, programming from what I've read. Um, do you think, obviously, this is obviously going to a better step in trying to g gain more, you know, children and family, and they're actually right now having even a kids' magazine? Um, do you do you think that with the WWE going you know into like a more fa uh, family friendly environment that you could possibly become in better terms with the WWE since their product is you know well, they're not going to be as good bad as they were before? Well, f first of all, I, I have heard how true or not I don't know. I'm just telling you what I hear that there has been uh, uh, some pressure put on them because there've been a lot of complaints about some of the stuff that they've been doing and so forth. Mm -hmm. As far as for me and my feelings. Uh, I, uh, I am appalled with everything that's happened, but if they w w turn things around, if they changed, if they made it more uh, fr friendly for especially children where they wouldn't show this vulgarity and all this crap like here's McMahon's and Kiss My Butt Club and there's young kids, six, seven years old, 
their parents in the audience, and I can't imagine why parents would expose their, their children to this sort of behavior. But if all that went away and it changed completely, whatever, of course, I'd be happy. And uh, uh, even at this stage of my life, if there's any kind of a contribution I could make uh, to, to that, that would be in a positive side, I'd be happy to. I'm not uh, uh, somebody in McMahon's organization that I'm a bitter guy. I'm not a bitter guy. I'm just terribly disappointed with what they've turned it into. I loved wrestling. I wrestled all over the world, and I truly loved the business, and to see what it has become, it has hurt. It hurts. It hurts uh, a lot, And uh, but yeah, if they made a turnaround, as you're suggesting and whatever, and if they wanted uh, my opinion or suggestion or help in some way that I could uh, contribute, uh, absolutely, I could put my... Uh, my feelings aside, uh, if, if it would be something that could improve the business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, uh, do you have anything else, okay? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to ask one more, uh, if that's okay. Um, do you, uh, you obviously had a, a match with Stan Hansen in Madison Square Garden, I believe, in uh, late 70s, and Stan ha- Hansen uh, accidentally broke your neck, apparently. Right. Um, was was uh, there any heat between you and uh, Hansen? Uh, you mean after the, the, after the neck? You mean afterwards or before? Or oh, afterwards? You no, I, 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 no, not on my part. I can honestly say that. Uh, first of all, let me let me t- tell you, in case you thought otherwise, uh, he did not break my neck with that lariat nonsense that they talked about. The way I broke my neck was I was coming off the ropes after shooting the tackle too. He went to give me a body slam, but instead of throwing me a slam, uh, we were sweating everything after about 15, 20 minutes of wrestling. And he dropped me and I came straight down on my head. That's how I got my broken neck, not, not from the lariat. Uh, for me, for my part, I was in a hospital, I laid up in a hospital a good while because for a while, my left side was like uh, semi-paralyzed. I, I had no feelings. Uh, I, I, I had no bitter feelings of any kind because uh, I always knew and understood that when you have big bodies in that ring uh, flying around and throwing each other around, things can happen. And, uh, and so that's how I took it. And for my part, no, there, there were never any, any really bad feelings about it at all. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> how are you doing health-wise uh, you know, uh, right now? Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm sure, I've had uh, more than my share. I've had three uh, very major back surgeries. I had hip replacement. I've had three, four knee surgeries. Of course, when I broke my neck, as the gentleman just uh, brought out. But I'll tell you what, I'm a stubborn old mule. I train <laughs> six days a week. I brought my weight from 275 down to 220. And I work out six days a week. I do three days uh, aerobic work, uh, uh, road work, and three days of pump iron. And for this stage of my life, I think if I may brag a little bit, I think I'm in pretty damn good shape. Yeah, I've actually seen pictures of you that were fairly recent on the yeah. internet where you were, uh, you know, you were you were flexing and. Uh... You look pretty, uh, pretty damn good. You look better than me, you know. You know, I'm thirty. But you like my hair, do on this, on that photo you're talking about? Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty. You know, listen, uh, real quickly. Let me just say this to you that you know, during World War II, I was in Europe, uh, and uh, we were driven from our homes. We hid in the mountains for like 14 months. I came very, I got very sick. I should have died. Really- I had rheumatic fever uh, because of the love of my mom and the care and everything else. A long story, but I survived it. The point I'm making is that when I came to this great country in 1950 and I started exercising because I was so sickly, I was 14 and I weighed like 80 pounds. And, and, and so when I started seeing a difference, I took up uh, uh, bodybuilding, uh, not bodybuilding, weightlifting and wrestling. I would wrestle three nights a week in school and I would uh, pump iron three days a week. Anyways, I saw my health improve and I was getting bigger and my appetite grew and I was getting bigger and stronger and I was competing and competing. I, it was such a wonderful feeling from having been sick for all those years because for three, four years I was really sick that I think to this day, even at this stage of my life, I can never forget about that, and that's what I think drives me to keep training, keep in as good shape as I possibly can, because there's a big difference between feeling healthy and and being at death's door. So that's what I really still believe that drives me to work out as I do today. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, that, that's such a good message probably for a lot of uh, young people in America today, too. 
Say that again? I was just saying that's probably a good message for a lot of uh, young people in America today to... Uh, yeah, yeah, because, you know, we have, at least if I can believe all that I hear in the news and that, I hear that, you know, the kids are spending too much time with television and computers, which is fine, computers and stuff, but but uh, and not enough time, the point is, to be physically active to where we have a... Uh, uh, young kids with weight problems and what have you, and that is a shame because uh, the, the, in the long run, you know, that 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 could uh, be very detrimental to to their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, we got Jason here, I believe. Is uh, he's calling from Pennsylvania, I believe. Oh, uh, hello. Yes, uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. Actually, uh, okay, Bruno. I wanted to, before I ask my question, I wanted to let you know that I'm Italian as well. And oh. my great grandparents watched you. My grandparents watched you. My dads watched you. When I was a wee tot, I've I've seen you wrestle Randy Savage. I've seen you tag team with Tito Santana. So I want you to know that as a as a young Italian man, I still look up to you, and I still look at you as a benchmark of what an Italian American should be. So it's a big honor for me to talk to you right now. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, my question is. Um, not a lot of today's fans really know about this, but you also worked in a league in Pittsburgh and Ohio that was separate from WWF at the time. Could you go into maybe, you know, explaining a little bit about that promotion? Oh, I worked for a lot of different promotions. I didn't just work for the WWF. I, for example, I, I wrestled for Paul Bosch. I used to go for shots for Paul Bosch down in Houston. I used to go for Roy Shires in uh, San Francisco. I used to go to Los Angeles. These were all different territories. I wrestled in Florida. I would go for, uh, what's his name, uh, Cowboy Latrell. I went to, for Nick Goulas down in Nashville and, uh, Memphis. Uh, I mean, you know, I, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, for who the heck was promoting that. Uh, I, uh, so I wrestled all over. I wrestled for all the different promotions. Uh, the, a lot of times when I was with the WWF all the time, they would always, you know, these Check. different promoters would call for my services to come to their different territories. But McMahon wouldn't always uh, allow me because, in all honesty, the Northeast had the most uh, big, uh, bigger clubs like uh, Boston Garden. Garden, in, in, you know, Madison Square Garden, the province of Rhode Island, the Civic Green. These were all 20, 22, 19, 18,000 uh, people arena. And McMahon would not run those clubs without me. So I, I wasn't free to go uh, out to other territories as much as I would have liked to. But I did. The St. Louis at Kiel Auditorium for Sam Mushnick. I, I used to, you know, the Bruiser and I in the Midwest, we, we teamed up even. So I did a good bit of it as much as I could under the the, 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 the circumstances, you know, that, that I was in. You're on. Hello? Yes, hello? Yeah, it was just us. One of the cars in the background was uh, was uh, talking. Go on, I'm sorry. Well, I, well, uh, I, did you have another uh, question, uh, Jason? No, uh, I just I wanted to... Thank you, Mr. Sam Martino. Well, I hope, Jason, I hope I answered your question, okay? Yeah, I was sorry about that. One of the, one of the callers, uh, uh, I, I don't, he must not have realized we could hear him while he's on hold, but uh, he was talking in the background. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. No, that's okay. Yeah. D did, you, uh, did you want to finish uh, your thought there? Uh, yeah, I wanted to, just wanted to thank Mr. Sam Martino again. It was a, a big honor, and if my great-grandparents were around, I would tell them about it because they were huge fans of yours, as I was as well. Well, thank you very kind. It's very nice to hear, and uh, that's one of the things I enjoy about making these appearances around the country is because you get a chance to speak to people which you didn't before throughout your career when you were traveling all over uh, everywhere uh, seven days a week. And so w when I appear in some of these older folks that tell me that they saw me wherever, uh, it's always uh, wonderful to meet them and to listen to the nice comments they have to make. And it, and it really is. I, I enjoy that very much. Let's let everybody know again that's uh, August 14th through the 17th. And uh, Bruno will be there on, six, on the 16th and the 17th, Saturday and Sunday. And that's at the Hilton University Place Hotel in Charlotte, North Carolina. And if you want to get your tickets, you go to nwalegends.com. We'll have the link right on our website. So it's, uh, just click on that. There's a banner right on the top of our page. Uh, thanks for calling in, Jason. Uh, we got a caller here from area code 310. Yes. Uh, what's your name? Uh, my name is John from Long Beach. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, do you have a question? Hello? Yep. Hello, hello, John. This is Bruno. Where, yes. Where... yes. Oh, uh, Bruno, it is uh, great to talk with you. Thank you. Um, Long-time fan and uh, <laughs> was able to uh, get a call in from here at work, actually. Um, yeah, uh, one thing out of all of the wrestlers that I've, you know, seen and heard over the years, you were the only one I've ever heard talk so highly of his mom. And uh, I think she's probably the young, unsung hero of the success of your career. And uh, so the first thing I wanted to just acknowledge, and maybe if you wanted to just say a little bit about how, what kind of a person your mom was. Well, you know, when she, my father had come to America, uh, I, I was born in 1935 in, in October. In January of 36, my dad came to America to work, like so many foreigners came here to work, but always to build their lives, their homes over there. So I was only three months old, but when the war broke, they closed all passages. So my dad was stuck here, and my mom was stuck over there with all the kids. And after the fall of Mussolini, uh, the, the Germans, uh, we were occupied by the SS troops, and they didn't take too kindly to us. And one-third of my time was literally wiped out. And those of us who made it out of there, we went to a mountain called the Valaroca, where we hid for 14 months. My mother, uh, with five children, I lost a sister and a brother. But a brother, a sister, and I survived. But I was the miracle who survived because, as I said, I came down uh, starvation, diseases, everything. But we buried so many people in that mountain. But I got sick. Nobody knew what was wrong. We found out later that I had, uh, came down with rheumatic fever. And what my mother went through to keep me alive, she swore that she had lost two children. She wasn't going to lose another one. And what she did to keep me alive, it's a long story, but it's an unbelievable one. And so my mom has always been my hero. I was fortunate enough that she was still living when she saw this human skeleton that I'd become to become a 275-pound guy who, who, who had even set some records in weightlifting and who became a wrestling champ and all that kind of stuff. And, and I'm so grateful that she lived long enough to see uh, that uh, all her efforts and all the sacrifices and everything that she just gave of herself that it paid off because I, uh, I, I survived and, 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 I, and I did well and she was extremely proud and, uh, and yeah, but my mom is my hero. There's, uh, she, she was the greatest uh, uh, person in the world as far as I'm concerned. She, she was your real manager. <laughs> well, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another qu a question, if it's okay, um, when uh, you lost the belt to Koloff, and then eventually Pedro took the belt, mm -hmm. um, what what was it that caused uh, them to take the belt off Pedro, and eventually have you come and take it again? Was Pedro not drawing the houses like you were? Well, first of all, let me explain with me real quickly. For those eight years, they had me working seven days a week, two weeks out of the month, and two other weeks I would have Sunday off. And so that was the only day I would get to come home. And when you do seven days a week, uh, twice, like I say, you know, two weeks out of the month and, and six days the other days, and you do that right. on a pace, and I was going to Japan, I was going to Australia, I was wrestling South America a good bit in those days. Uh, I, I was a guy, anybody who knows me would tell you in the business, I would not even take an aspirin. And I right. w was getting hurt, and I would go in a ring hurt. And after eight years, my body just, I, I just needed to get out. I needed to, to, to heal my body. And that's why I said I had to, I had to get out. I had to get out. I just couldn't go on. And so I did, but I did. A lot of people said that I had retired. I didn't retire. I was merely getting out to try to heal my body, to rest up and start working out properly again because I, everything was hurting. I go to the gym and I could hardly train because my elbows, my back, my neck and knees. And I, I, I took some therapy. And then what I did was I started wrestling. Like if I go to Japan for two weeks, I would take off 10 days. If I, if I go to St. Louis or Kansas City, I'd wrestle for two, three days. I would take off a week. If Dick the Bruiser and I, we teamed up in the Midwest and Chicago, Indianapolis and all those places, and I would take three matches, but then I'd take off uh, a week or 10 days. 
then I healed up and I was really feeling good again, but I was loving the business because I didn't have that ridiculous schedule of, of every day, every day, every day. But then what happened was uh, with Pedro, uh, yeah, unfortunately, the, a lot of the clubs like Boston and Pennsylvania here, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and places, the, uh, the clubs were going, uh, were not uh, staying up. And so uh, McMahon uh, gave the title to the what's name uh, Stan Stasiak, mm -hmm. and then uh, th and then they approached me and I said no because I was feeling so good and I and I would go to for Paul Bosch down in Texas I I went to uh, for Sam Sam Moshnik I I would go you know maybe every second month I, I was just doing all these kind of things and, and loving it because in between uh, my body wasn't being tortured like it had for those eight years but McMahon uh, 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 met with me in fact his son was with him and he said to me look I just asked for one year till we have an opportunity to really find somebody that can can carry the ball and uh, I, I hesitated but he says to me I'll make you a deal he says you come back for one year you just work the major clubs which would mean you'd work maybe three times a week and that's all I would ask of you he says for about a year till we find the, the right guy well, one year went to two, two years went to three, and on the fourth year is when I broke my neck with Stan Hansen. Right. And that's when I told McMahon, I said, you know, uh, one year was the deal, and this is four years. So I said, so I said, you, you better find it, Mr. Wright, because uh, otherwise, I says, I I'm getting out with the, with this thing. And so then they went, and they, uh, uh, Billy Graham, I think, came in for about eight, nine months, and then uh, Backland followed him and then again I started loving the business because after I got healed and everything else if you guys remember after my broken neck in fact uh, I was in the hospital and McMahon was calling me almost daily because they had made a match between uh, Muhammad Ali and Inaki and McMahon had uh, put, come up with a lot of money for close circuit with this Bob Aram the promoter and the darn thing was a bomb it wasn't selling tickets anywhere so McMahon felt that the only way he could be bailed out if I would come back and wrestle uh, Stan Hansen, the guy who broke my neck, and and uh, I actually came back way, 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 way too soon against my doctor's wishes, who were furious at me and my family because McMahon said that if he didn't make that match with what commitment he had made with Aram in a closed circuit, it could take the company into bankruptcy. So that's uh, I came back, but then I took off, and then I started doing like I had done between titles. I would just take shots here, there, and everywhere, and I was very happy again. But then it came time where age catches up with you, and my last big fling in the business, if you guys remember, was with Larry Zabisco, where we sold right. out Shea Stadium, and we sold out every other arena that we ever went into, and it, to me, it was a nice way to go out, and that's how I got out of the business. Mm -hmm. Wow, I see. Well, uh, let's say we've had uh, Larry on a few times uh, on the show. And, well, uh, I'm, really just, uh, I'm just wondering uh, if, if you still ever keep in contact with uh, Larry and if you had any problem with him uh, using the living legend name. No, 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 no. I have no problem. No, I don't keep in touch with him much because I uh, was living in. First, he was, I think he was living in Georgia. Then I think he was living in uh, uh, Minnesota. And so, no, I, I, I don't keep in touch with him or anything like that. But uh, a living legend, you know, that's not something that <laughs> – it's not a title that I gave myself. It's, hey, I'm wrestling living legend. <laughs> right. This started out – one time we went that stretch of 22 straight sellout in Madison Square Garden. And somebody wrote in a magazine and I said, this guy is a, is a true living legend. And when Vince McMahon Sr. heard that uh, remarks made by the magazine or whoever made it, he, he started saying, well, well you know, the, 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 they got together and they started announcing me as wrestling's living legend. It was never me who claimed to be wrestling living <laughs> legend or anything like that. But then the magazines and promotions everywhere. I'd go to Japan, they call me wrestling's living legend. But it was not something that I claimed uh, a title that right. I would be offended if yeah. somebody else <laughs> We called that or anything, so no, that never bothered yeah. me. It's definitely more of a heel move to call yourself the living legend. <laughs> well, no, right. uh, no. Nah, nah, so believe me, no, no. no yeah. As far as that with the biscuit, no bad feelings whatsoever. Right. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you read yeah. his book or not, but he really puts you over in the book. And uh, oh, he is that right? Yeah, and he also yeah. There's a lot of. Uh, 
Well, a lot of the books just dedicate it to, you know, the build up to, to your oh, guys. Really? Uh, to Shea State. Oh, that's his book. His book is out. Do you mean it's out there to. Yeah, to... you can buy it. Yeah. Uh, we oh, had okay. him on the I show didn't... and we talked a lot about it. I didn't really know great. that. I, I did not know that. But yeah. I left. I left to get. A, I left to get a copy. That <laughs> definitely. I'm sure. I'm sure he, he can get a free copy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll, uh, well, Bruno, Bruno, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to speak with me, and uh, thank you for your stance regarding the Hall of Fame. I, I'm, you know, with what you said in the past, I definitely would. Uh, you know, steer clear of that. You don't need that. It's not a real Hall of Fame. If anything ever happens to the WWE, that so-called Hall of Fame would no longer exist. You know what? I appreciate anything. you saying that because uh, a lot of people have told me exactly what you're telling me, but I also have my critics who tell me that uh, uh, who am I that I refuse uh, an honor like that, this and that. And I try to explain over and again uh, my personal feelings, how I'm against everything that they've done and that are doing. And so what kind of a hypocrite would I be then if I would accept their uh, their Hall of Fame, which in my opinion is not even legitimate because, uh, uh, you know, what is if I asked you if you have a child or whatever, you want to go to that Hall of Fame, where would you go? Well, where is this Hall of Fame? Exactly. Right. I mean, it's you know, it's a thing where McMahon uh, uh, does these DVDs. He goes all over the world. Uh, I'm told 126 countries, and that they sell these things, they make money, all that stuff. But as far as the legitimacy, I, I I don't see any of it. And no, I, I I would feel for me like I'd be a hypocrite with how critical I had been with what he's done to wrestling, and and then to accept that. Like I said, I. I'd have a difficult time, uh, not that I have a pretty face, but I have a different time I'm looking in that <laughs> mirror in the morning. <laughs> Speaking of DVDs, um, I've emailed Georgianne a few times, and I think she might have spoken with you. I would do anything to get my hands on some of the DVDs you, you used to have on your website, like your Strongman DVD and your Bruno, Bruno's Workout. Is there any way I could... Get one of those, or order them, or get in touch with someone. No, you that can't can help order me. anything like that because, to be perfectly honest with you, I wasn't interested in getting my my, my attorney. Forget the, uh, the attorney; he's an attorney, but he's a good friend of mine who was a big fan of mine when he was young, and he felt that boy, you got to you should have a DVD for this and for that and the blah, blah, blah. And he was the guy who was really pushing for it. I was never too much for that. But the, 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 the strong man that you're talking about, that was done by George Romero. You know the filmmaker? Yeah. Okay. He, he's the one who did that. That's a documentary of, of my life at the time. He did that. He chose 10 different athletes. And I was the wrestler, uh, uh, the only wrestler amongst the other. And, and he uh, made mine one hour long because he was fascinated. My, my folks were still living. And so to, when he found out about the ring, what took place, ring the war and all that kind of stuff. So mine was about that part along with then my career in wrestling. And, and, and that's why uh, mine was one hour long where the others were half hour. But that was a, 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 I thought he did a great job. And then, of course, I don't know if you remember the greatest sports legends, which they did a weekly show. And yeah. uh, Tom Severs was the host of when they did me in California. I was honored I got with that. that. You got, okay, I was honored with that because, you know, I was the only wrestler that they ever chose uh, for the, the sports legends. So, you know, I, I've been fortunate that I uh, have had some nice uh, things like that happen. But you know what? I'll tell you what, I'll talk to him. His name is Marty Lazaro, my friend who so happens to be an attorney. And uh, I, I, everything I have, because people ask me, I, I give it, I give it, and I swear to you, I don't even have a copy for me. But if I can get something, I'll go through Georgiana, she knows how to get a hold of you, I'll try to get it for you. Oh, that's really I nice. I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, and, and uh, Bruno, God bless you. Thank you so much. Oh, oh, thank you so much for... Uh, oh, but now, am I talking to... Uh, that was John. <laughs> this, this is yeah, John. Okay, so I, thought I, was, I yeah. thought I was being told, yeah. okay, he, he, kind of, he kind of took over, but uh, he seemed happy to talk to you, so I, I, I let him take a, take a few that, questions. <laughs> great, great talking to you. Thanks. Uh, when you talk about uh, being champion you know, for eight years, I actually read that... Uh, there was like plans or something for you to uh, win the NWA title as well, but yeah. you didn't do it. Is there any truth to that? 
Yeah, there was absolutely truth to it, and I uh, and I didn't want no part of it. Uh, uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, this sounds crazy. I know it sounds crazy to a lot of people because, uh, for example, I'm probably the only guy. I say probably because I don't know for sure that uh, that wanted to, to to not be champion. After those eight years, I thought, man, I don't want any part of this. <laughs> and then, like I said, uh, I was very reluctant when I came back the second time because McMahon uh, assured me just one year, and I told you, went to four years. And, and I was angry and a little fed up with that. And with the NWA, which meant uh, they were discussing uh, uh, Sam Moshnick and McMahon, because Sam Moshnick was the president of the International Wrestling Alliance, McMahon, of course, with the World Wide Wrestling Federation, and they were... Uh, having problems about Sam Moshnick says he needed me for 17 days out of the month Vince McMahon needed me because of all the major clubs in Northeast he needed me like 18 days out of the month in other words you know uh, they needed uh, 30, uh, 35 dates uh, <laughs> on a 30 day month okay, right. but, yeah, but anyway, I, I was never involved in these uh, in these discussions. But when I found out about it through a a partner of Vince McMahon and Toots Mond, a guy by the name of Phil Zacco, and he told me about it because he knew how I felt. Because he and I were pretty close, and I used to express my feelings about not spending enough time at home, not seeing my family. My parents were up there in age and all that kind of stuff. And he told me what was going on, what the discussions were. So then I. Uh, uh, held a meeting. I called up Vince. I talked to Vince McMahon, Toots Mond, a guy named Willie Gilsenberg, who was part of that organization. Phil Zacco was there, and I told him, I said, "Let me explain something to you, folks. I understand that you're having all these meetings where I'm, where it concerns me." I said, "And I understand that you have problems about who gets what dates." I said, let me make one thing clear so you all understand. Number one, I'm really not interested in this whole thing. But if, it, but, but if we go through with it, I said, let me just make this clear. That four days out of the month are mine. That's the Sundays. No more, you know, every other Sunday. I said, I want those four days out of the month to go home, to be with my wife, to be with my kid, to be with my mom, my dad, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so I said, I, who gets how many days? I couldn't care less. So Toots Mond was the guy who told McMahon because he was never in for that unification of the, the, the titles. He said, we're doing so great. Why rock the boat? Why get in, involved with, with this? So anyway, the, then the, the problem was the dates because Sam Mushnick needed X amount of dates, McMahon X amount of dates. When I took those four days, because the way they were working it out, they were going to have me work seven days a week, uh, uh, period, and then no days off. Mm -hmm. And so after that, they uh, uh, they decided that let's leave things as they are, and that's how it, it, the thing fell off, fell true. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, Andrew, do you have a question? Yeah, actually, uh, Bruno, I was wondering what uh, if you had any memories of working in Madison Square Garden three before the one opened in '68. Any memories of wrestling in Madison Square Garden before '68? Yeah, in the oh my goodness. Yeah, I wrestled in Madison Square Garden many, 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 many times before 68. Mm. 68 was when we opened up the new Madison Square Garden. Yeah, right? Was yeah. it 68 or 69? I'm, 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 I could be wrong which year. But, yeah, but prior to that, it was in the old garden that I took the belt from Rogers. That was in 63, but I'd wrestled before 63 over there. And then from uh, after the... Roger thing. I wrestled in the garden every month. In fact, we used to go every three weeks in the 60s in Madison Square Garden until uh, uh, the new garden came up, which I forget, so 68 or 69, then we went right into the new garden. So I, 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 unless I misunderstood your question, were you saying that I, I wasn't wrestling in the, Just, uh, before no, in no, the no. garden? <laughs> Just uh, memories on the building, what was it like? Oh, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I know the new modern buildings, they're beautiful and they're fancy. But I'll be honest with you, I like the old Madison Square Garden because the old Madison Square Garden, just like the old Boston Garden, they were they were built in a way where instead of being uh, spread out like all over the place, they were more like old, more straight up to where, like the fans were always closer mm -hmm. to that ring than the new ones, because the new ones kind of 
really sp- you know what I'm talking about when they when I say spread out they they, they went way out west the the old garden uh, just like the Boston Garden they, they were like you know they were closer and you went up but but always closer instead of spread way out. Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, mm-hmm. more kind of an intimate uh, atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And I, so, I, I, for myself, I thought those old uh, old arenas were more fitted for for, for boxing and, and wrestling. I thought, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I've actually been in the uh, the old Boston Garden because I live here in Massachusetts, and I you know I remember when you uh, had a little comeback and you were wrestling uh, uh, Macho Man. I just thought uh, was wondering what you thought about uh, you know wrestling with uh, Randy Savage back in the day. I, w- I was very angry, uh, upset about wrestling a lot because when I retired. I didn't want no part of go, ever going back in that ring again. Yeah. In 1985, when I came back in 1984 as a color commentator, after Vince Senior had passed away and Junior had taken over, I had no idea what direction Junior was going to take. At that time, though, he asked me if I would come back. He more or less said to me, like to keep in his dad's tradition, who better than me who had been around all this time. I bought into it, and so I came back as a color commentator and. I thought in my own mind that also maybe as an advisor, but I, I found out pretty quickly that that wasn't the intent. I guess because it was so well established, he thought that I might be a plus to have me in the organization with the TV commentating because I had been doing some of that with him before. But he brought my kid in, and uh, uh, when so- the clubs already start going down with Mr. Hogan as the champion, like Boston and Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, they were already uh, not doing as well. And McMahon asked me to put on the tights to see if I could uh, help those clubs uh, uh, better, and I, of course, wouldn't have anything to do with it. But then they told my son, he said, "You know, too bad if your dad would put put the tights back on." He says it would help you out because of the name and everything else. And and my son bought into it. I tried to explain to him that if McMahon wanted to do something with him, he could do with him like he was doing with anybody else that he wanted to give a, a push to, you know. But uh, my kid felt that, you know, that uh, I should do it. And I don't want it to be said in case he didn't make it that I didn't try so right. to help him. So I agreed to put on the tights, but uh, very, very unhappy, didn't want no part of that. So when you saw me at that particular time when I put on the tights, Believe me, it was not something that I wanted any part of. I did it because I felt I was put in a position uh, because of my kid, uh, and so I did it. But no, these were horrible memories for me because I absolutely didn't want any part of any of that. Mm-hmm. Well, sorry to bring those up then. <laughs> Excuse me? I, I said sorry to bring them up then. But uh, did you have a question to answer? Yeah, I actually did. You said on the ROH straight shooting interview that you and Buddy Rogers didn't get along. Do you know uh, if there was any reason you two didn't uh, get along so well? You know what? You know what's a good question. I'm not sure I can give you a good answer. The first time I, I, I met him, I saw something in Rogers without talking to him. I saw him. Uh, not talking about him. I saw. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm being honest with you. I saw something that I thought. I don't know. This this is not a guy that uh, I would uh, uh, I would trust in any way. Um, uh, he just. Uh, and then I started hearing a lot of different things about him. And uh, uh, and whatever he saw in me, I don't know. But I don't think he was crazy about me either. It was just one of those deals where we just didn't like each other from day one. Mm-hmm. Did you think that helped at all? Actually, like uh, when you guys were, if you guys were in the ring together, because people could tell that, like you know, they just didn't like each other. Uh, I don't know what the people could see or couldn't see. I know this: that uh, whenever I wrestled him, I tried to uh, uh, to give my best for the fans because you know I always said that thing. Uh, you know, they paid money to come and see a match. So you, you owe it to them to give the best you got. But at the same time. I was always uh, very, very cautious with him because I didn't trust him, and I just felt that if he had the, the opportunity, he would try to, try to do something that could be uh, dangerous. I, I just uh, that's how I have always felt about him. I, I, I didn't trust him. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did you think about uh, Ric Flair uh, taking up like the Nature Boy uh, gimmick and name? Well, you know, I don't know too much about the history of that. Uh, uh, it, 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 you know, uh, but Buddy Rogers, let me say this about him. 
<laughs> Buddy Rogers had a great presence in the mm-hmm. ring. And, you know, he was not one of these steroid freaks like that followed. This guy worked out good. He was always in good shape. He had a good body. He wasn't a big muscle head guy, but he had a terrific looking body. And he had that uh, nice uh, uh, head of hair, blonde, of course, and he had that strut. Uh, he was the, an original, and, and there's no question about it that when he stepped in that ring, uh, uh, as far as the fans go, they, they saw, they saw the, 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 the uh, arrogance galore, and, <laughs> but, you know what I mean? But, but the, he stood out, and he was, uh, he was, he was great in the ring. He really was. So, uh, I, 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 I um, a lot of people, I shouldn't say this maybe, but, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, in my opinion, uh, as far as who's copying who, there's a difference between the two. To me, Ric Flair was, was always hard worker in the ring. There's no question about it. He, he worked hard all the time, and he took a lot of money. But if you watched Ric Flair, his matches, in my opinion, were were pretty much uh, the same. If, 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 if whenever you saw him, uh, Buddy Rogers uh, was very versatile. He, he was very different. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, talent-wise, I, I like that. I like somebody who could uh, be very versatile in, in, in his uh, in his in his skills. Mm-hmm. And I saw uh, that uh, much more than I would see in, in Flair. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, that's my that's my opinion. You know, you could right. disagree with me, but that's what I believe. Mm-hmm. I've heard uh, other people have have the same uh, you know opinion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Too, too repetitious for me. Too repetitious. You know, in my case, I had people say that I was a brawler a lot of times. What they saw on tapes was maybe the third match of a series. But if you saw me, for example, against the, in Shea Stadium against Pedro Morales, we went for an hour and 18 minutes, strictly 100% scientific wrestling. There was not a, a, a punch, not a kick, not an elbow, strictly scientific wrestling. When I used to wrestle Hans Mortier, the European wrestler, was a terrific wrestler, same thing. But then when I wrestled Bruiser Brody, yeah, you saw more of a brawling match. Uh, if you saw me and Koloff, you saw a lot of great high spot to high flying matches. But then, as the second match got a little nasty, by the third one, yeah, there would be more of that. But I was a guy who did not want to be repetitious, and I used to uh, 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 study my opponents. And if I wrestled Kowalski, I would wrestle Kowalski his style. If I wrestled only or Jonathan, I would take him on his style because I understood uh, in, to myself very clearly that for me to keep to keep to stay okay with the fans in the arena month after month, year after year after year, I couldn't go in that ring and be very repetitious with uh, with all my matches. Mm-hmm. So I used to try to study my opponents and, and meet them at their own game, and that would make me a little bit different. With some guys, it would be strictly, like when I wrestled Ray Stevens, we had great matches with Ray Stevens style, but then you wrestle Kowalski, you don't do the same kind of match you would do with Ray Stevens or with Kowalski, and so on. So you had to look at your opponent and adjust to to what the best match you could have with that guy. Right. And I've always believed, I've always believed in my heart that that's what kept me on top. Listen, if this sounds like bragging, so be it. But I'm the only guy who for 20 years, when I finished up with Zabisco, I was still selling out the arenas. So mm-hmm. I must have been doing something pretty good that <laughs> right. the people kept coming. Mm-hmm. I'll say, would it, was it like um, stressful or hard to like... You know, keep people coming to Madison Square Garden. You know, every month because it's you not know, like today where they might go there once a year. So obviously they're just going to come no matter who's there. But to get someone to come to the same show every month, you would have to keep them, you know, really interested in it and wanting to see the show. Well, and that's why I believed in what I believed in, and that is to to to, to be different, not to go in there and 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 have the same match. To to, to be different all the time. To be to, to, to give a different kind of a match, I, th- I think it just made it interesting. Uh, for example, if I wrestle a strong man like Ken Patera, well, I was known to be a strong man in my time. So the question was, oh, who's strong? Who's this? Who's that? So then you had to do display of a lot of strength stuff along with the wrestling stuff. And I think just a, a, a bunch of different things like that is what kept the, uh, the fans uh, 
uh, interested and curious, you know, about what might happen, what might happen. You take a guy like Kowalski in his heyday, in his prime, you know, Kowalski was like a tiger in that ring, and, and there was a lot of people think like, geez, Bruno Strong, and this and that, but boy, this guy, he's so vicious, he's big, he's six foot six, two hundred seventy five. Hey, what, what kind of a match? How's that going to be? And we would go out there and not disappoint them. There you would see a lot of brawling and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, people, you know, they, they, they bought it. They, they, li- they loved it, and they would keep coming back. And, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, I, uh, but they did. They, they, I mean, you know, we, uh, we used to do great business. In the, the only time the guard night uh, we didn't do well was after we lost. We used to be on a, a Channel 5, the, the big, big station. And when we, and, and when that station, uh, uh, took new ownership and they dumped some programming, including wrestling, for a while it was rough because we tried to run the guard. When I say we, the, the promoters, Vince McMahon and Toots Mondanet, tried to run the garden without the TV. And there we start seeing the gate drop and drop. And in fact, I, I even told Vince at the time, senior, I said, you know, you better meet with the garden and explain that we're running without TV because I said, if business keeps going down, they may not want you as a tenant in the garden. Right. And in fact, they did meet with the garden and the garden helped them get on the Spanish station, it was uh, UHF station, it was channel 47. And it just took us a couple months to be on the air. And that's when we opened up the new uh, garden. Me and uh, a guy named Crusher were doing, we sold the place out. So we already did developed an audience back enough to to draw enough people from that we could sell out the garden again. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you ever? Uh, I don't. I can't recall you ever doing this. Did you ever work? Uh, you know, as a, as a heel, as the villain. No. Oh well, I, I, I may have been looked Maybe at like uh, that in Japan and that because yeah. you know well, you were always the villain when you were against the Japanese, right? right. But, but not that my uh, no, not that I actually. Uh, uh, ever uh, used that st- uh, the, as a, to, to try to get over as a villain? No. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you ever? Uh, did you ever want to? And then whenever I try to talk into it, mm-hmm. there probably wouldn't have made any sense I to can, do it. I don't ever remember anybody trying to talk me into it. But uh, no, I, uh, uh, I, uh, 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 since people talk to me well from the beginning, I saw no reason to think yeah. anything else. You know, right. I. I I just stayed, and then not only that, but I did have a lot of pride, and I met a lot of Europeans, and and they seem to be proud of, especially the Italians, uh, of me. And I don't want to uh, do anything to, to to make them ashamed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. right. So, uh, so no, I, I I no, I never thought of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just want to let everybody know. Uh, you mentioned Ken Pateri just a couple minutes ago that he's actually going to be at the uh, the Fan Fest as well. Well, that's great. I'll tell you, he's one guy I've always had tremendous respect for. As you guys, uh, I'm sure you know, he was in the Olympics twice. Uh, this guy's uh, uh, a legitimate, uh, strong, strong man. He was the very guy. I had some great matches with him. I still love to wrestle Ken Patera. Uh, he, he was just great. I mean, I... I, I uh, uh, I, I, I have nothing but praises for him, and uh, I haven't seen him in so many years. I hope I have the opportunity to, to see him and, and have an opportunity to even talk to him because uh, I, I, I always liked and respected Pater. He's a tr- tremendous athlete. Mm-hmm. Uh, another guy I know you uh, work with is uh, Baron Von Rask. He's also going to be there. Oh, is Baron Von Rask there too? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, well, you know, I had some. Uh, I wrestled him a lot of times as well. Uh, I liked him, not that I ever got to know him personally, I really never, never did, but I loved what I used to hear about him. I used to hear that uh, he, this guy was a, a, a genuine good guy, that he was a good family man, that he was uh, uh, gave a, a time in Minnesota places for... For, for for charities and stuff. Uh, I mean, I just heard nothing but really good. I, I, like I say, I never got to know him well. I really don't know him well. But I, I always heard very good things about him. And besides that, you know, he was a very good amateur wrestler besides yeah. being a, a pro. So, you know, the, 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 obviously he's an all-around guy, a good, good guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got a caller here on the line. Who is this? Uh, hi, this is Mike. And... Uh, Mr. Samarjana, this is an honor to talk to you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I just have two questions for you. Um, one, I read online where they had a rumor to a story where you wrestled an orangutan. Is there any truth to <laughs> yes, that? I did. 
But that I wrestled that Durang attack, but that was before I turned pro. I was working actually construction, and uh, 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 somebody, an iron worker, uh, said that there was a carnival came to town, and they said that uh, 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 nobody could last uh, five minutes, and and if you could, that you could get to make fifty bucks. Well, in those days, this is in 1957, I think it was. I was making two dollars an hour as an apprentice carpenter. So when he says fifty dollars for five minutes. I said, oh, man, I said, you know, that's a lot of money. For, to me, it was a lot of money. And so I said, five minutes. I said, I should be, able, you know, I was a big, strong guy. I was uh, competing in weightlifting, and I'd been wrestling, you know, for about four or five years at the time. So I took him on, and I will, I'm uh, not proud to tell you that I got the worst of it. When they put me in the cage with that sucker, uh, boy, you want to talk about power, um, I, one time I tried to get behind it. I thought if I could pull him off from those bars and get him down on the floor, maybe I could do something with it. Heck, when I, uh, after about seven, eight attempts, I finally did get to behind him. That thing swung around that cage, a huge cage, swung around that cage like it had a flea on its back. And I, and I mean, I was a pretty big guy at the time. Uh, no, I, I, I uh, fought it best I could, but believe me, uh, I, I got the worst of it. Uh, <laughs> when I came out of there, my eyes were both uh, shot because they were so puffed from its kicks. He was like two pistons his feet. He would grab the bar and then come kicking at me, and he would always go after my head. And uh, unfortunately for me, connected more time than he missed. And I, uh, I, I came out. I could hardly see. I was, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I fought him for 15 minutes. But I would say that out of the 15 minutes, he, he had the best of me for about 13 of those 15 minutes. <laughs> well, so the orangutan would probably be up there. Very with powerful. <laughs> I'll tell you how powerful it was. One time with one arm hanging on a bar, with the other arm, it swung at me and it scooped me up and threw me against the bars on the other side. Uh, and, and I mean, you know, at the time, like I was big, I was like 260. Or I, I don't think I was up to 275 yet, but I, well, I mean, I was way up there, maybe 250, even I don't know. But it scooped me up. Uh, I, I just didn't know how powerful those things were. I just had no idea. But I sure found out that uh, that day, and I'll tell you, yeah, yeah, I did wrestle the orangutan, and like I say, I uh, unfortunately. Uh, Shouldn't have, because I took a pretty good beating. <laughs> That's awesome. The orangutan and, um, will not be at the fan fest. Excuse me? Oh, I was man. just saying, the, the orangutan will not be at the fan fest this year. Well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. I don't want to hey, see that might, orangutan that, again. <laughs> that might help Vince with some ratings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, have him wrestle one. Final one. question. One final question I had is, uh, do you ever wish that your son had more success in wrestling than he did? For one thing, uh, I, I have three sons, okay? Uh, uh, one of them, uh, well, one of them is a, um, he's in law enforcement. He's a, he's a narcotics agent for the state. He's a heck of a wrestler. He wrestled in high school and he wrestled in college. But he uh, 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 never went to the pros because... Uh, uh, he wasn't interested in the pros because at the time when he came up, it's when Junior had taken over, and they too uh, uh, was turned uh, turned off with it. He he he, uh, he didn't care for it. Yeah, my other son, which is his twin brother named Danny, they both go about 240 pounds. Danny's very good shape and uh, strong, and he has some wrestling background. Uh, they they just uh, uh, you know I guess they also saw uh, how I felt about the, the wrestling today, David. It was the one who, who did go for the pros, but uh, he, uh, he uh, I, I, well, I don't know how to describe it. If he didn't have the patience, if he was in, in a hurry and he felt like he wasn't getting a, a proper break and something, he would get very angry and discouraged and what have you, and finally he just uh, more or less decided to heck with it, and, 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 he, and he left the business. Mm. Uh, he didn't, he didn't go near as far as he should have or maybe could have. Mm -hmm. He just didn't have the passion for it, like uh, like yourself. The what? I said maybe he just didn't have the passion for it, like yourself. Well, hey, you know. Not uh, everyone does. That's right. You know, it's possible, yeah. Uh, thanks for calling in, Mike. All right, thanks. Mike. Yeah. 
Okay. Take care, Mike. Yeah. Did you have a, I think you tried a question here about a Haystacks Calhoun. Yeah, you were yeah. the first man to actually lift him off his feet. I just wanted some uh, your memories on that. Well, uh, yeah, I do have memories on that. And let me tell you something. I don't want to be sound like, uh, like, um, uh, uh, I don't know what's what is the proper word like complaining about somebody else. The truth is that when I picked up Haystack Calhoun, uh, the media thought that this weight was exaggerated because they kept announcing him at 601 pound. They got uh, uh, one of those scales that they had the guard, and they wanted to see him on the scale, and he actually weighed in at 620, but 619 and a half, or but it was just about 620. Now, I did pick him up at that time, uh, um, uh, but later when he was picked up again, they said, well, you know, poor Haystacks came down with uh, sugar, and his weight had dropped down to like 450 when he was still wrestling, but they still kept announcing him at 601 pound or whatever. And uh, I think a couple of guys picked him up then, and they're saying, well, Bruno wasn't the only one, but the truth is, Bruno was the only one who picked him up when he was 620 pounds, and that's a fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, was it uh, much fun wrestling the Haystacks? Or? Well, no, because, you know, God rest his soul, he was a good guy, but, you know, he wasn't the guy that, well, I mean, how much could you do with him in the ring? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, I'm, I'm talking about for the fans who, 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 in their minds, I don't know what they thought they would see when they hear, oh, it's that Scalhoun against so and so. But in reality, they, they, they're really limited as to uh, uh, how much action you could give the, 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 the match. Because, you know, when you wait as much as he did, how much really could you possibly, what are you going to do? Go start arm dragging him and uh, whipping him to corners and flying him. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't work. <laughs> so the match is you tried to do the best you could. I would do some strong stuff with him. But it, but it, it, it was really kind of difficult to have what I'd call a really good match. Mm-hmm. It's not the same as uh, being in the ring with like uh, Anthony Oraka. Uh, you, why you go that far back? Do you remember him? <laughs> actually, I I uh, I'm not like uh, live, but I have seen him on tape. And he's yeah, actually, well, I, uh, the, the thing with him, uh, I, I was tag team partners with him, and then I wrestled him three times in Madison Square Garden. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tony. Uh, again, he was not a muscle head. If you saw him, like he, you know, like some of these uh, steroid guys, but Tony had a great conditioned body. When you saw this guy, he had no fat on him at all. He was very, very solid, and I mean, really, really well conditioned. And he was probably the first of the aerial guys. Yeah. I mean, this guy, he, he could stand in front of you, and even if you were six foot uh, three or four or whatever. Boom, he'd do a real quick leap and he'd be sitting on your shoulder. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, and like when it came to drop kicking and flying good scissors and, and the stuff like that, he was, uh, for that era, for, you know, for, for that long ago, that time, he, he really stood out, uh, well. And, he, and I'll tell you this about him because I, got, I knew Tony well. We toured South America together, uh, one time. Uh, he, uh, he always kept himself in great, great shape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's great. Like, uh, you know, if you if he's anybody gets to see the tapes out there, I want to bring him up because that's actually uh, like one of my uncle's favorite wrestlers of all time. Say but, that uh, again. Who was I, that? I want to bring him up because that was actually uh, one of my uncle's favorite uh, wrestlers. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh no, he was very, very popular. Tony, Tony Rocco was very, very popular in his day. Like I said, he in those days, you know, you didn't find guys that did all their aerial stuff, you know, like like he could do. Mm-hmm. So naturally, the fans. Uh, you know, took to him. He was a big star, uh, for, you know, for years. Uh, no, no question about it. Yeah. it uh, yep. well, we want everybody to know you check out the website nwalegends.com. You can uh, see Bruno in person among, uh, there's, you know, dozens of uh, legends going to be there. And uh, on that Saturday, August 16th, you can get uh, your picture taken with him. And uh, then on the 17th, there's a Q&A, and then there's a autograph uh, session, and, you know, you get a couple words with him. Uh, Q&A with him and Ivan Koloff to be hosted by Chris Cruz, who's a really good guy. Uh, check that out at nwalegends.com. And uh, is there anything you want to tell, uh, you know, all the fans out there? Uh, well, uh, I, like I said, I, because I haven't uh, been in, in Charlotte, I, I, I re- honestly, I mean it sincerely, I'm really looking forward to uh, going there and, and uh, to meet, uh, uh, I understand people coming from all over, but from the people that are from that area who may have uh, uh, 
uh, heard of me or seen me in the magazines or on TV or whatever, but never saw me uh, wrestle in person. Uh, maybe they have questions. I'm looking forward to meeting them and try to accommodate them best I can uh, when I get there. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, to Charlotte and to all the, the folks that uh, come out. And again, you know, if they allow me a uh, question, answer, whatever, I'll try to accommodate them best I can. Excellent. I uh, really appreciate you coming on tonight. I thank Definitely. you very much. I, I truly enjoyed it, Jack. It was, it was, you know, uh, it, it was fun for me, and uh, I, I thank all your uh, the callers. You know, they, they were all very nice, and I. Uh, I hope uh, I did okay in answering their questions. Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Can we just uh, keep you here for a second? This is Ox Bacon. You just heard me. And remember the saying, uh, be nice and sweet to all the people you meet as you go through life lottery and now the same folks you meet on your way up. you got to talk to them on your way back down. Thank you for listening. I know you enjoyed yourself. If you want to send me thank you letters, that's quite all right. Just come... August 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. We might even carry over to the 6th and talk to Hawksbaker.